Hey there, and welcome to episode 100 of Into the Terminal. That's right, 100 episodes we've been at this. And so uh, I'm joined by my co-host Nate and my co-host Scott. Really excited. We've got 100 commands we're going to cover in this episode. So with that said, why don't we dive on in? Scott, you want to lead us off? Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we started with very early was getting a Red Hat subscription and like standing up your machines. Um, but I'm continually re reminded that people have not seen RHEL in a while. So let me just tell you what it's like working with this subscription now. I've got this machine and I want to install some more software, but it needs to be subscribed first. So I'm just going to register it. So I put in my username and my password, which is, of course, uh, I wish Eric it was my bestest friend. And that's <laughs> it. When our, remember when our default password was nice hair for a while? <laughs> I, I thought right. about growing it back out, just saying. <laughs> So at this point, the machine's registered. And like now I have access to all the Red Hat content and all the stuff stored in the Red Hat repositories. So I can do things like um, see what software I want. So maybe I uh, want to install something that's web console related, but I can't remember exactly what it's called. So I'm just going to do a DNF list star cockpit star. And that's going to show me all the stuff installed on this machine that complies with that plus all the stuff available there under available packages. Um, and I feel like we could do an episode about all the ways to find the thing that it is that you want to install, like DNF provides, DNF search, DNF list. <laughs> we actually did do an episode on um, both subscription management and also on um, managing packages with RPM. So. There, there's been some of that content already. All right, but now that you know what you want, maybe we just install something. So you tell it the name of the package you want to install, and it goes out and finds it, and we'll pull down any dependencies, and you can say, yes, go ahead and install this. And there you go. You've installed a package. Um, maybe you want to remove a package. So you tell it you want to remove a package. And it'll look at the installed machine and say, oh, I see these are the packages you want, and these are the ones I have to remove for dependencies. So yeah, go ahead and delete it. Um, and there you go. Gets removed. If you're interested in seeing what's already on your system, DNF list installed. So this will go through and show you everything that's there. Uh, and you can use it with tools like grep, which Eric will talk about in a bit. But realize that DNF is a front end to RPM and the RPM database. That's our packaging technology. So I also like to use RPM QA to give me a list. That'll give me the um, name, the version, and the architecture of the package. What's missing from this compared to DNF list installed is the repository that provided me the software. And then you can also look at a bunch of metadata. One that I use a lot is rpm-q dash dash change log and the name of a package uh, because it'll show you all the changes that have been made over time to that package version. And so this is something I use a fair amount for things like uh, has a bug been fixed? And if so, in which version? Uh, or has a CVE been mitigated? And if so, yeah. in which version? Yeah. yeah. So you can see the CVE numbers here are listed in the change log. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit on package management. But uh, Eric, we, we did episodes, and I can't remember what the episodes were. So uh, in the chat and following the episode in the show notes uh, will be links to previous episodes for the first seven commands in our episode today. You can check out episode 22, subscription management, and episode 33, managing packages with RPMs. I think there was an episode on CVEs where we talked about the that change log one as well. Maybe we'll have to dig that up and add that. I think Nate Indeed. volunteered to find that one. Maybe, <sighs> maybe Nate can track that down. Well, Scott, I think you're next with uh, system management. 
So we've got it, our packages, yeah, so look, we've got our services installed. Let's go from there. Exactly. So now that we've got the machine registered, we've downloaded some software and installed it, uh, we're ready to run it. So maybe we're doing something like system CTL start. And I'm just going to start up a web server. So I'm running Apache. Um, but how do I know it's really running? So I can do a system CTL status. And that'll tell me that it's active right here. It's running. Um, and if I want to no longer run it, system CTL stop. Right. And if I look at the status again, right, it is inactive, dead. Um, the other thing that is so ominous. The other thing that uh, I often use with system CTL is restart. So if you make a change to a configuration file, you need to start the service using its new configuration file, system CTL restart and the name of the service. And so that actually performs two actions. It does a stop and then does a start back again. So uh, you can see that Apache is running again. And then one that um, we use a fair amount here on the show is if we install a new service, like an email server, Postfix. Who would do that? By default, I know. By default, when we install it, it does not get started automatically. Uh, not only that, typically when you install services on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, it will not activate automatically at boot. So if you manually started it with system CTL, but then rebooted your machine, it wouldn't be running when it came back up the next time. And so for um, in our shows, you'll often see us use system CTL enable, which sets the service to start at boot time, dash dash now, and also start it right now, and the name of the service, All right? So that'll not only uh, add a symbolic link into our startup uh, system D setup, so that at boot time, the service will start automatically, but also it'll get it running right now. So if I do a system CTL status, all right, we can see that it's running right here. Um, but thanks to the enable, you'll also see up here that it's enabled, which tells me it will start automatically at boot time. But we did an episode or actually multiple episodes on services and system D. Uh, Eric, what, what did we do there? So if you look back to episode uh, 81, we looked at top five systemd tasks where we went into these different actions in a little bit more detail. Uh, episode 82, six types of systemd files, which was a deeper dive into the services, uh, timers, and a few other topics, as well as episode 83, building system uh, systemd services. So I think Nate took, uh, took the lead on that episode and talked about... Uh, uh, Nate took the lead on that episode and talked about building your own systemd service file. Yeah, I vaguely remember that. That was a while ago. <laughs> it feels like a while ago, but it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> 18 episodes ago? 17? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so we are doing... Uh, we are doing a hundred episodes. A hundred episodes. This is our hundredth episode, and we're doing a hundred commands. Now, I got to say, guys, we we've got to scrap the episode and start over. Sean Tanu said, "Using variations of the same command does not count as separate commands." I I reject <laughs> Sean Tanu's reality and substitute my own. They're perfect. <laughs> well, I mean, I I I suggested that it's think of it more as a hundred different actions because system CTL start and system CTL stop yeah. are two very, very different outcomes. <laughs> and and actually these... we had this, we had this religious discussion in our show prep a few days ago where it's like, <laughs> should, a lot. should we allow that to occur as we're making our list of 100? And uh, you can blame manager Scott who said, <laughs> if the command produces significantly different function or output, it should be permitted as a separate command because it's doing something entirely different. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it should be 100 actions instead of 100 commands, but th that is a good point, right? So if the command significantly well, differs, yeah. Yeah, right, it doesn't sound as good. <laughs> is it a good point? So, I don't know. So you see what happens when you put the three of us together, and this is a perfect time to go in and like this episode, share it with a friend. This one's supposed to be lighthearted and fun, so you'll see some some additional banter. Uh, if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. That way you see when we produce other content like this. Uh, but 
we're going to keep on going because we're we are 12 commands in and we're 10 minutes into the episode go ahead scott i was just gonna say eric you get to kick us off with lucky number 13 <laughs> oh gosh you did that on purpose didn't you maybe <laughs> all right so so host Eric doesn't spend nearly as much time as he used to uh, on the command line. And I tend to forget things like obvious. How did how do I run a thing? And so uh, in, in preparation for this episode, I was working on uh, running a few different commands, maybe some of the arguments I'd forgotten. So one of the nice things to do is knowing how to get help on uh, how to get help with your commands. Uh, when when you're in the command line. Sure, you can go over to Google. That works great. But not always do you have a chance to go in and, uh, and, and look at Google. Sometimes all you have is a terminal and a prayer. So that's where the man co page comes in. And I think I remember that command for a long time because it's like, man, how do I run that command? But it's actually short for manual. And you can search by keyword. Uh, so maybe I'm setting up a new user account and I want to remember how to set up their password. So I can do a manual keyword search for, say, the password command. Or technically, this is how do I search for commands related to a password. So it will do a search for all the man pages within our Linux system. And these come installed by default. You didn't have to do anything else. And uh, I, I see Shantanu still still in defiance about our, our, uh, our episode. So... Here's here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to change the expiration date for uh, for a user account. So first first step or first command on the list is actually the change command. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in deeper on that and see how do I use the change command to get the uh, to get the expectations that I was looking for. Maybe it's a contractor, and I want to specify the last day that that contractor is going to be able to log into our systems. Maybe I just need a brief description. Um, and I can kind of skim through here. In fact, fun fact, you can use the slash and then search for a search for a keyword and you can skim through it uh, using the uh, in key for next. Next up uh, is um, what if I'm running a command looking at you LVM and I forget exactly how to do a specific argument for a command, but sticking with our change, let's do a change dash H that's dash uh, uh, dash H for help and lovely. It gives me a very short explanation of some of the different options I can use in this command. Um, so if I forgot that, uh, if I forgot, uh, uh, account information for a user account, I can do a, now I can see that I can do a list and see, uh, when the last time the rel account changed its password, which was today. Cause that's when I spun up the lab system. So Scott, I think we had a few episodes on help in the past. Indeed, we did. We had uh, episode you drop 15, the hand off. yeah, <laughs> built-in help, and episode 86, a more recent one on finding help in the distribution. And Eric, you're going to continue us on with editors and tools, right? Uh, yes, I am. I want to so see you Eric never... use Emacs. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait to blow my my punchline there. Gosh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll be quiet. So we now. actually ended up with more than a hundred commands. So we we took a few out. Uh, and, and I was gonna I was going to make the joke about how we were going to install Emacs and then we couldn't exit the file, so it ruined the episode. Uh, but then I realized in Rel nine that uh, Emacs actually um, is not installed in the minimal base image for Rel nine anymore. So we were going to talk about Nano. We were going to talk about uh, we were going to talk about Emacs, but they weren't installed, so uh, we decided to jettison those. But I can, we can talk about the vim command, which is also uh, the vi command. And uh, yes, yes, uh, Emacs just closed the entire window. That's that's how I've exited in the past. I mean, vim's <laughs> the only editor you need anyway, right? It, it is the one and only editor. In fact, I I know people that use vim like an IDE, so why not? I was there. So because because we were <laughs> uh, because we were planning ahead for this episode and we're not frantically working on it f uh, an hour before the show went live, we actually created a text file here on this system, and and we wanted to impart some 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 wisdom, some some wise sayings from from our past. So I created a text file called wisdom.txt, or txt, 
Fun fact, you actually don't need file system extensions in Linux. We covered that a little bit in more detail in a previous episode. So I'm going to use Vim to call a file. And I'll let you all read that off, off screen. But uh, uh, so why, why is sayings from the Linux system? Now I can use I for inserts. And I can add I can add text. I can use escape to exit, uh, and then a colon x to exit the file. Um, that'll save my changes and exit. <clears throat> and so again, we we had an episode episode eighty four called Linux based text editors, where I think Scott and Nate uh, went through and talked about uh, Vim, Emacs, Nano, and a couple of others at length. So check that episode out. One of the other tools, one of my favorites, and probably one of the all time most popular episodes of Into the Terminal ever was episode 32, where we covered one of my favorite utilities ever called Tmux. So Tmux is a terminal multiplexer, aka I need to do things and I need more than one window, but I only have one terminal. So as you can see, it kind of changes our prompt a little bit. <laughs> and uh, and that allows me to uh, to start doing some things. So maybe I can use cat and check out the wisdom file that we we were looking at before. And then I need to go run something on the system. So if you use Control B, that is the command uh, key for Tmux, and I could do a con uh, Control B D to disconnect, as long as I don't wait too long for the command to timeout. And you notice instead of exiting, it says that we detached from session zero. That, that's how you that's how you exit Emacs is you just put it in a Tmux window and just ditch that session altogether. <laughs> um, so now if I've got multiple sessions running, I could do a Tmux ls. That'll tell me that I've got one session open, session zero, and it's got one window within it. And then if I want to reattach to that one, I can do a tmux attach, oh, tmux attach, and it brings me right back where I was. This does not even cover the basics of tmux and how powerful it is. So check out episode 32 of Into the Terminal to find out more. But we're not done because uh, Far from tmux. It. Tmux and ed text editors are not enough. Sometimes you need to use, say, the tail command to look at the bottom of a file. So if you look at tail, we can look at var log messages, which is very typical for your uh, for your troubleshooting processes. Uh, and so tail will actually show you the bottom 10 or so lines of a text file. But let's say you're doing something in real time. Oops, tail and you want to follow the output of that file. We can use the daf dash f argument and use messages. So now as, as anything is being written to var log messages, it'll show up on the screen. And Shantanu, before you say anything, that was actually one command. I just showed you two alterations of it. So one, two, and one. So there. <laughs> if you want to exit out, uh, control C brings you back to uh, your regular terminal. And then Let's say we're looking for a specific, uh, a, a, a specific text string. I speak for a living uh, within a file. So let's we we were looking at the rel uh, the rel user account earlier. So let's check Etsy password uh, to see what uh, to see how this uh, is configured. So within the Etsy password file, you can see that rel's got its own line. Its UID is 1003. Its group ID is 1004. It's got a home directory of slash home slash rel, and it's using the slash bin bash uh, shell. So that's grep, tail, tmux, uh, vim, and or actually vim, or yeah, 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 yeah. So if you want to learn more about tmux, check out episode 32. And uh, I'm, I'm sure we did. I'm a, with both. So go ahead. I'm sure we did it a episode on grep and regular expressions at some point. Uh, so I think you and I did early on. I'll I'll see if I can track that one down. Yeah, because like grep one one string, child's play. Grep. Oh yeah. Twenty seven <laughs> characters that mean meta meta functions. Pro Piping it two yeah. or three times. <laughs> Man the. <laughs> The weird incantations that I have done at the command line to try to find certain things out of logs before we had, you know, better tools for said things, you know, like log analysis tools and whatever. It's crazy. Piping it through sed and awk and grep and yeah, all kinds of TR. And you and you <laughs> use cut a couple of times to clean it up. Yeah, right. So right. It's crazy. Nate, have you looked at the uh, session recording lab that we have out on lab.redhat.com? 
Um, have I looked at? It? Yes, I've I've seen it. Why? <laughs> yeah. So like a very last uh, step in there is to use the T log play command to replace someone's session. Um, yes. And we wanted to make it copy pasteable, and so I wrote the gnarliest <laughs> uh, regular expression. It was so bad. Go into the log file and grab the UUID of the session that we recorded earlier in the lab. And it's like, I pasted that last week at a conference on the screen. I was like, just just pretend like this is just a UUID. I was there. You apologized before pasting it. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. You don't need to know what star carrot dot star star is. Just just, uh, I, I, I beta tested that lab before we published it and and I'm pretty sure the lab description underneath it says by the way if you don't know what this means don't worry it's okay this is in in the end this is what you get <laughs> just, just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain <laughs> yep it's baseball. mission accomplished right <laughs> And I, I so just want to done... say that that I'm I'm with Richard and um, I think Marco both in the chat. I'm a screen guy, Tmux, whatever. Screen is gone, and I'm sad. <laughs> well, I was also a screen guy, but now that it's only available through extra packages for Enterprise Linux repository, uh, and I only use the default, uh, I have now converted to be a Tmux person. And you know what? It's right. It's bad. I don't mind it so I've much. Done, I've done now, some Tmux too. It's it's not bad. But yeah, I, I so do this screen. I had all the muscle memory and now I've got to re, re, reprogram it. <laughs> the only so constant actually, is change. That's true. So I, I, I used screen for a couple of months and then every time I'd look for how to do XYZ, I started finding uh, Tmux references instead. So I was like, well, I'll try it. And so I switched. And I switched pre-announcement of screen being deprecated. So win for the IT. Aren't you aren't you just very full of forethought <laughs> and luck? <laughs> so fortunately, some of these are a little bit easier to talk through because right now we've gone through 21 commands in 22 and a half minutes. So Nate, why don't gonna, you uh, why don't you take the con and let's I'm gonna talk try about my best. <laughs> All right, so networking can sometimes be complicated, and anyone who remembers the days when we were doing IP tables and IP chains even to manage our local host firewall should be happy for firewall command, firewall CMD through through uh, firewall D. So I'm going to give you a quick example of how to open a simple port with firewall CMD. And there's, there's more complexity to this available. I'm giving you the simplest a solution here. I got too many numbers in there. There we go. So what this is going to do is it's going to add port 4242 TCP to the running configuration. This, this will not survive a reboot. It doesn't get written to the config. So if I restart the firewall, this is going to go away. But that's fine for this example, right? Um, now you might be like, well, how do I see what's actually open in the firewall already? There's another very simple command to get that. And again, this can be filtered down with more command line arguments, but we're not going to go into them. List all will simply say, here's all the things, all the zones, all the services, all the, all the ports, whatever, that are currently uh, in existence in your firewall, right? So you can see right here is port 4242 that I just added. You can get crazy specific with this by adding in zones and by adding in sources and destinations. Um, but again, I think we have other episodes where we talk about firewalling. And if we don't, we should. Maybe that's another topic. <laughs> All right, another really cool tool to that, has, that has evolved over the years. Uh, the days of managing your network configuration via text files is mostly gone. Um, NMCLI, and there's a couple other tools like NM2E, which I think is deprecated at this point. There's a graphical version that runs in the web console, but NMCLI is a really handy one that runs at the command line. Uh, I'm going to give you two examples of just like what NMCLI can do. So there's NMCLI con show. And you can use shorthand for these things. You notice I forgot the W in show. That's muscle, mes muscle memory again, because lazy systems are lazy. You type as few characters as you can. I'm going to show it to you on another machine, too, to give you a much more 
interesting output. This is my home lab hypervisor, which you could imagine there's a whole bunch more interfaces here because I've got a bunch of like bridges and, and virtual networks and there's containers running here. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on on this machine. So you can see that it's actually paginated and you know there's, there's uh, color coding that goes along with, I forget what the colors stand for, but there's color coding that goes along with the type of connection and whether it's active or not, they'll show up red if they're inactive, that kind of cool stuff. So NMCLI, another great networking tool. Uh, let's see, what do I got next? IP. There's a whole suite of commands within the IP subset, right? Let me clear the screen so you guys can see better here. Uh, let me go back to a simpler display first here. So IP is just this general interface to the IP substack or IP stack of your machine. So if you do IP address or ADDR or just IPA will get you what you need. Cause like I said, shorthands work, work here. Uh, it'll show you the IPs that are associated with your system. And again, if you go to a more complicated system, more complicated interfaces will show you more data in there, right? Um, then we've got IP route. If you remember, there used to be a command that was just route, I think. That might still exist, but IP route is the new way. IP route just shows you, you know, here are all the routes for the different interfaces. And as I said before, more interfaces means more complex routing. So you can see on my hypervisor, there's a ton more routes in there. And this is all based on how your TCP stack will decide how to route how to route packets around. Uh, okay, let's see. Next, we got so, IP link. So Nate, Nate yeah. real quick question from uh, from the audience. Uh, and sure. I felt this was uh, appropriate. So Aaron asks, how do you know when a shorthand will work for uh, for a command? Uh, I'd imagine I mean, that my the... knee-jerk reaction was just try it. <laughs> yeah, well, so the, the manual page and whatnot will probably give you some indication, but generally I've only found it through like use, you know? I try to type a command or I see an example online and I notice that they're using shorthand and boom, it works, right? Not all commands will let you do that. IP lets you do it. <laughs> Pray, that's a good answer. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, IP lets you do it, NMCLI lets you do it. In fact, I didn't know NMCLI let you do it at first, and then one day I just typed out a command, or I missed the letter in a command and it worked, and I'm like, oh, look at that, it does shorthand. <laughs> so uh, there you go, right? <laughs> There's no science to this. All right, where was I? Uh, IP link. This will just give you like a quick rundown of the Ethernet interfaces that are in your machine, MAC address information, and whether they actually have a link or not, right? So that's sometimes useful in troubleshooting. This one's really cool for uh, if you're trying to troubleshoot network connectivity, and it's called IP neighbor. This will tell you about the neighbor addresses that are that are known about in your IP stack on your machine. And again, shorthand, IP nay. I'm talking to horses here, right? So you can see that this, <laughs> this machine only knows about one other one other machine, right? That's because this is this is another machine that it has talked to, that it's reached out to. What's so funny? <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> and then again, we got uh, on my hypervisor, IP nay is like, oh, look at all these things. I've got addresses in here from my Podman containers. I've got addresses in here from my VMs, all kinds of great stuff. So again, this isn't, this doesn't like scan your subnet and figure out what all of the local addresses are. These are things that are in, I think it's in the ARP cache for this particular machine. And we go way deep on networking to talk about what ARP caches are and what, but there's no way we have time for that we have, today. <laughs> we have not covered that topic in ITT. Maybe we should. Yeah, right. Well, these are like networking concepts that maybe some Linux administrators don't care so much about. <laughs> Maybe you should. I've built up all this knowledge over years and years of working with network gear and like wearing too many hats in my, my roles. Okay, moving on to the next cool command is SS. This is not the selective service. This is, I don't even know what SS stands for, Scott. What, why did we call this SS? <laughs> I don't know. I still use, uh, I still use Netstat, so don't ask yeah, me. Yeah, well, this is, the re this is the replacement for Netstat. Why? I don't know, but SS... Um, I like this particular, so if you do just SS, boom, it gives you this, this very, I mean, I, I never use this output. This is very verbose output that just shows all the connection information on your machine, right? Uh, let me clear this. The one I like to use, and I actually learned this in Red Hat training, um, dash T U L N P. And this is like TCP UDP, what L does. 
N is um, networking, I think. P is protocol. Uh, no. Port. Sorry. So L is long. N long. is numeric. Numeric. I guess that wouldn't yeah. be network. Of course it's network. <laughs> numeric. So but then FS um, must just be a rewrite of Netstat because I usually use Netstat. Yes. As, uh, I, I could never figure out if it was like turnip or tulip or something, but I was like, oh, yeah, that command. Yeah, yeah. Uh, socket statistics, says Marco. Thank you. <laughs> so this tells you about ports that are open and listening on your machine, which is mostly what I care about as a systems administrator. Did the service that I started start up? Does it have the port listening? Are there ports listening that I don't think should be listening? That's a good thing to actually watch for from time to time, right? So SS is a great way to get that. There's a bunch of other data you can get out of SS. Again, we don't have time to dig too deep on SSS. Uh, another great troubleshooting tool is trace path which is the replacement for trace route i forget if trace route even exists anymore or at least on a rel box in my case the default nine, trace i don't path. think so right so trace path is just like trace route you give it a destination we're gonna trace route out to google google dns server and you'll see right look at that it's it's giving me each hop of the way uh, which gets out to my ISP and then dies. And the reason it dies is because my ISP probably has ICMP blocked. With ICMP blocked, trace route, trace path, ping, can't get can't contact that particular uh, uh, spot in the route, right? So, but what this is doing is, what's my default gateway? Let's try to see if we can talk to it. Oh, we did. What's its default gateway? Okay, can we talk to that? What's that thing's default gateway? And it goes step by step by step by step until it gets to where you told it to go to. So you can see, right, it gets into my ISP. There's my there's my cable company, uh, whatever those non-routables are. Those are probably within my, uh, within my ISP's network, right? This isn't like crazy private data. This is data that you can get just by simply doing a trace. So, uh, but yeah, you can see it even goes through. It even reports back on these non-routable addresses. They're, it's able to reach them because of the magic of routing. So there we go. This is a great command to memorize if you often get in arguments with your uh, with your networking team. Oh, it's not yeah. the network, it's your system. Then you just do trace path and go, look, here's the router in our data center. It, it's not getting yeah. to the other data center. Fix your stuff. The number of times I've identified routing loops by using trace path, because what you'll see is it'll get to a step and then it'll start <laughs> looping between two routers. And what that means is one router has its default route somehow misconfigured that it loops back to the place it came from. And then, of course, that that router says, no, no, it has to go this way. And then they just go back and forth like that. And the trace router will eventually die. But that's that's an indication of an actual routing problem between you and the destination. So you got to identify who owns that router. Hopefully it's someone you can actually contact and tell them your router's misconfigured. And then, you know. Boom, you can get the, the problem fixed. So that's that's handy. It's, that's probably the most useful thing I've seen with TracePath. All right. Next was ping. Ping is related. Um, I'm just going to ping my gateway. This will tell me, can I reach my gateway? Right? So uh, in this case, on Linux, this will be a continuous ping. You have to control C to stop it. There's command line arguments that will do things like make it make noise when it pings. So if you're trying to monitor whether a system is up or whether it stays up or whether it misses pings, you can start a ping with a dash A, I think, is the that, command. That, that will not annoy your coworkers at all, having it make beeping no. noises every ping. Look, I'm telling you, in, in troubleshooting, it's, it's immensely helpful because you can start the ping and have it beep every time. And then the window's off the side or behind another window, and you can tell audibly when it either stops pinging or starts pinging. So it's a useful tool. Uh, Scott but went a different L. direction with that than I was thinking. I, I was wondering I mean, if, if, if you did that, if you had to, before you typed it in, say, one ping only, Vasily. That's a you could. dash C. Dash C will yeah, send the dash counter. D, dash C1. Ping dash C1. <laughs> Off the reservation, I'm going to make a typo. My, my, hunt see, for October, uh, my, my hunt for Red October uh, joke was was lost on my co-host. Oh, I didn't even catch it. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, perhaps you can tell I am a Russian sub captain by my accent. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually really good. <laughs> 
Uh, all right. So the next one is a really fun tool. I have used Netcat and abused Netcat in so many ways. And there are so many terrible things you can do with Netcat that I do not suggest you leave it installed on your servers. But when you need it, you need it. Right. I've used Netcat to move disk images across the network. It's crazy. <laughs> so uh, and I'm going to give you a quick example. So you might remember we opened up a port earlier with firewall CMD. See how I'm tying these together? It's great. Uh, we're going to make Netcat listen on the same port that I just opened. So we're going to do NC for Netcat dash L and then we're just going to give it a port. And then what you can do is you can redirect that output just like you can redirect anything. Normally what this will do is it'll just throw it to the screen. But we're going to move it and we're going to redirect it into a file. I'm just going to call it file because that's really creative. And then I'm going to use that as a way to show everybody's favorite command, Telnet. <laughs> we're going to Telnet over to the machine that I just opened that port on. Uh, what's the IP here? 121 on port 4242. And as long as I got all this right, look, we're connected. Now, what do we connect to? We connect it to Netcat. Netcat is just listening, and it's just an open socket. Anything that I put in there will go through that socket into the file I just redirected it to. Now, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Like, if you're an attacker, you can use Netcat to open up a remote shell by piping this crap into Bash. So that's why I said you shouldn't leave it on your machines. So uh, we're just going to close the Telnet connection by hitting uh, Control bracket, and then close. And then you'll see Telnet exit. And also, you might have noticed in this other window here, my Netcat also exited. If I cat this file, you can see, hello, ITT. So, you know, pretty cool. Imagine if you had a file you needed to move or if you needed to redirect output from one command to a command on another host, which is crazy, like, level, why would I ever want to do that? It's great that you can if you need to. <laughs> so, Nate, I would like to point out that in the past, on many of the episodes where we talk about networking stuff, when either Eric or I say tell that, like, the chat immediately blows up with, you more. You cannot use Telnet. And yet, Nate does it. Nate does it. Everybody's like, that's cool. Yeah, Everybody what, likes Nate. <laughs> what, what, what is this? <laughs> ah, all right. So let's uh, let's move on. <laughs> all right. Two more commands. Wget and curl. They're both similar commands. They serve slightly similar but slightly different purposes. I like to use wget when I need to do like a recursive get of something because I don't know that curl does that. At least I've never found a command that makes that easy in curl. With wget, it's just wget dash r. You point it at a site, it'll clone a site down. Don't ask me why I'm cloning websites. You probably don't want to know. Uh, but curl will instead get that output and just display it to you, right? So we're going to show you wget. I just wget on redhat.com. You see it makes the connection and it grabs an index.html file. If I cat that index.html file, this is, I mean, if you were able to parse all that, this is redhat.com's main website, right? So, wow. I am just just got distracted by chat. Richard Rios wgeted his wife. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Curl, on the other hand... Now, I tried this with redhat.com, and it gave me an empty page. So I don't know if we somehow don't like curl. Do we block the user agent? I don't know. But if we no, do a curl on, what's that? Wait a second. Uh, is Shantanu going to accept this as multiple commands? Because they do the exact same thing. But they're different. So look, and you, we only so listed no them as one command. This is number 35 on the list. It is funny, though. These are different commands, and we list it as a single number. So uh, sorry, Shantanu. Maybe it evens out in the end. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Google will will work, right? So if I do a uh, curl on Google.com, there you go. That's the output of Google. I mean, which, as you might imagine, is laden with scripting and God knows what else is in here. But somewhere in there is the search engine, I'm sure. Oh, look, there's some Japanese or something. Look at that. Fun. Okay. So, yeah. Pretty curl sure and wget. Somewhere. Now, curl is really cool for if you need to like go grab a specific thing. A lot of people like to, in their install instructions, do a curl or a wget that pipes directly into bash. 
please don't do that. I give up fighting with amateurs. Thanks, Shantanu. <laughs> <laughs> episode 101 troll the hosts yes yes all Maybe right you're trying to impart um, some knowledge on us go <laughs> i am i am totally totally trying to do that all right so um the next two these are two separate ones are ssh and sftp now you might say why not scp that's because scp is deprecated if you try to use it it just back ends it with sftp anyway uh, i'm going to give you some really quick examples of these two so we're going to go back well, here we'll just do it on this command if i go to ssh uh to my user at nope at 10.0.0.28 this is the other test host that I was using earlier. You can see I get a shell from IPT0 to IPT1 as my user. Now I've got SSH key pairs set up here to make this simple, uh, but there you go, SSH. This is primarily, I mean, if you guys don't know what SSH is, I don't know how you're managing your machines. This is the way, at least the way most of us, I would think, manage machines, right? You're SSHing into machines, unless you're 100% Ansible, in which case you're still using SSH because it's using this in the backend. So Nate, uh, I'm using Telnet for all my machines. You're using Telnet to manage your machines? We used to do that, Scott. Used to do that. <laughs> Long time ago, 30 years ago, I was still using Telnet to get into my Linux machines. It was a terrible idea. So many machines got compromised in those days. <laughs> All right. Uh, the other one is SFTP. Ah, SFTP. I'm trying to rush here. Um, we're going to go back to the same box. 10.0.0.28, and you'll see we get an FTP prompt. If I do an ls-a, you can see there's my home directory on the other host, right? So again, this is um, it's kind of simple. SFTP is made for moving files back and forth. SSH is made for connecting and getting a shell, right? And, uh, you know, both pretty handy utilities. And that's my cover of networking. Was that, Did I go too fast? Should I go back and do it all again? We have plenty of time, right? Right over. Um, so, so it's it's a good thing we gave producer Eric the day off because we're 42 minutes in and we just covered uh, command number 37. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just means so, we got to be faster for the rest. <laughs> does it though? Because I mean, we're all having fun. So uh, yeah, and and our manager's here. So if we're late to a meeting, we can just blame host Scott. <laughs> So, Sorry, manager so Scott. Don't derail us any further. <laughs> Scott, save us and, and talk about some file system management. All right. So, file system management. Once I, once uh, I find our, your, once I find your share, there it is. Our episode on that was like way, way back, super early. Episode nine, I think, was the last yeah, time we talked about <laughs> file system management. Yeah, you're not wrong on that. Uh, we'll talk about why later. 90 it's our shtick. Uh, all right, so some file system stuff. Uh, first, you might be interested in seeing what file systems are there and their statistics. So DF talks about your disk free. And I like dash H because it gives you in human readable sizes. And P, I think, is like pre-formatted. So it like makes this nice uh, column or output. Um, there is another uh, disk metric to look at, though, besides the space, the disk space that you're consuming. So DF-I uh, will show you the inodes that are in use. So uh, inodes are basically a file pointer that tells me how to reassemble all the data blocks off of disk to reconstitute a file to retrieve it. Um, and in some file systems like ext 43 uh, and others, it is a finite resource that's created when you make the file system. In other file system types like XFS, which is the default for RHEL 9, um, XFS uses dynamic inodes. So if you start to write out of them, we'll convert some data storage blocks into inode blocks to make more of them. Um, but maybe you're interested in creating a new file system. So if we are just direct creating uh, disk partitions and whatnot, we can use FDisk on our device. So this is my SCSI disk drive, and I'm going to create a new partition and use up the rest of the disk space. And I'm going to write my changes to disk. 
And now if I do an F disk dash L shot new, don't worry, this isn't an, ex, uh, an include command. Uh, we could see there is dev SDA three. Uh, but because this is a primary hard disk that my boot or shares uh, the same as my boot disk, I need to run a command called part probe, which sends a signal to the kernel and says, hey, recache all the disk file system information, or, or sorry, all the disk partition information um, off of the disk. So part probe, re um, ingest the partition information about your disks. All right, right now this is just raw space. So I can do an MKFS to make a file system on it. I'm gonna do an ext4. Um, if I wanted to make it an XFS formatted file system, which is the default for RHEL 9, um, I would do a dash T XFS, and that would call the com correct component backend utility to do it. I'm choosing ext4 because there's a really, really small partition, so small that uh, the overhead formatting of XFS, including dynamic I know tables, uh, well, it's not big enough. So um, ext4 is uh, light enough of a file system that it can just handle this really tiny device. Um, so now the device exists. We put a file system format on it so we could store and retrieve files out of it. However, it's not attached into my directory tree yet. So I have no way for applications to put files into it or get files back out of it. So we're going to mount it. So you tell it the device that you want to mount and then the directory where you would like to attach it. And ideally, this is an empty directory because once we mount it, those are the files and directories stored in this <clears throat> partition, SDA3 that we created and formatted. Um, if this directory was not empty, we would only be able to see the stuff in SDA3 and anything that was there previously would be hidden and inaccessible until you unmount that file system from the directory tree. Um, if you're interested in seeing what your mounted file systems are, mount. Uh, so that I'll show you all kinds of information. It's DF that we've looked at at the very beginning of the segment also shows you mounted file systems, uh, but this gives you things like the options that were used when performing the mounts, whereas DF just concentrates on the statistics. So that's a little bit on file systems. Should we move forward, Eric? I, I, I have no banter uh, around disk management. So uh, yeah, why don't we jump guess, into performance of observability? I guess file systems aren't as entertaining as networking. I mean, honestly, I'm controversial. I, I don't know. <laughs> I say this, and Conan Kudo always like. Uh, I think I make his like. Uh, I, I veins bulge when I say this. <laughs> uh, really cares about storage, um, until they can't get the files back out again. Then they really care about storage. But they uh, care about it when it works. They don't care about it when it works. They care about it when it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um. So performance observability tools, we did a whole episode on these. Uh, episode 95, performance with BCC tools. And we're not gonna do BCC tools today, but they're a huge suite of tools that you can use for getting information about your system. Uh, today, we're gonna do stuff like, maybe we're interested in seeing what processes are running on the machine. So we have PS, process status. And I like all, show me the username that owns it and give me those processes, even those without a controlling terminal, uh, which would include things like daemons. So these are all the processes running on my machine. Uh, maybe you're interested in not just all the processes, but the ones that are the most expensive to run. So our front top gives you a little bit of system information at the very top, um, and then it will refresh the list of top commands that are sorted by the amount of uh, CPU they are consuming, and then secondary sorted on the amount of memory they're consuming on your system. And every so often, I think it's every uh, five seconds, three seconds, it refreshes that list. All right, and then use Q to quit out of top when you're done with it. Uh, so somebody said about traceroute. Well, guess what? It is in RHEL 9. 
uh, you just have to install the Traceroute RPM. And Yay. It's it is a deprecated tool. But the reason I decided to bring it up here is because um, it is also available in other Unixes and Linuxes. So while TracePath is a Linux native tool uh, that is the new replacement, if you're working on your Mac, say, uh, TraceRoute is what you want instead of TracePath. Um, if you're interested in some other information on your system, like how much memory you have, free. So I'll give you the amount of memory, how much is used, how much is available or free, how much is being used for shared memory, how much is being used for buffers and caches. Um, and then available is actually free plus share plus buffer cache. But is that free as in freedom or freedom as in beer or free as in beer? That's, that's as in free as in unallocated. <laughs> All right. Another memory uh, tool is VM stat. And I give you your virtual memory statistics. So here we're looking at... Uh, some information on processes. I don't remember what RMB stand for anymore. Uh, how much swap memory has been consumed, free memory, buffers, caches. And then it gives you statistics on different types of things like swap in and swap out operations, uh, some IO data, blocks in and blocks out, some system information, um, and then some CPU information on like user consumed CPU cycles, system consumed CPU cycles idle CPU cycles, I, uh, I await cycles, and I don't remember what ST stands for anymore either. All right, this one is cool because you can pass it some other arguments that will actually have it continuously run. And so you can tell it an interval on how often it should wait. And then you'll just like build this list of series data over time that you can kind of see how things are changing on your machine. Uh, similarly, we have one for IOSTAT. Uh, IOSTAT gives you the specifically block IO device information. So it starts off with some kind of general CPU stuff, but then you can see that per device, I have two, SDA and SDB. And we get the transactions per second. We get the uh, kilobytes read per second and kilobytes written per second and kilobytes discarded per second. Uh, and then we just get a raw number of kilobytes read, kilobytes written and discards. Uh, this also is something that you can run on an interval or a specific number of times. So you can generate some time series data to see what's happening on your machine over time. Um, so if you're having intermittent problems or you're trying to like figure out if something is related to something else, you can run it kind of in a background terminal to generate this data. And then you can refer back to that data when the event that you're looking for occurs. We were having weird, um, disk latency problems once with our our san and uh, io stat was the savior we basically ran it in the background every so often and collected stats so we could see when it was that it would slow down and things like that really really helpful tool when you need it again like no one cares mm -hmm. until you need it for sure <laughs> right um so nate i added this one just for you time time and that's not everyone's got time yes not system time Right, it's time as a wrapper for another command. Right. And so it runs the command that you wrapped. And then down here, it tells you about how much time this thing took to complete. And it give, breaks it down into three categories. Real time, that's actually like, I was a human and I experienced this much time during the completion of this command. User time, so this is how much Clock cycles consumed on the CPU were tagged as user uh, consumable clock cycles and sys system consumable clock cycles. And so I'm just gonna do something um, silly like time top, right? So top is an interactive command, right? It's running and because I wrapped it with time, time is back there gathering data this whole time that the top command is running. It's just like figuring out, putting things in those three buckets so that when I quit the command, when the command exits, right, I'm told that almost 18 seconds of human time passed when this command is running. And then it was only using uh, 0 0.011 seconds and 0 0.016 seconds of processor time for user-related tasks or system-related tasks. So this is uh, expensive in human time, 
but not very expensive in CPU clock cycle pi. All right, one that uh, everyone hates, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. Esther, do they hate it like they hate like they hate like they hate Telnet? Uh, good question. I don't I don't think there is a command that they all hate more than Telnet. At least not in my experience. Except, Unless except what I name. Right, then they love it. I don't know. Um, so S trace is a command that will actually do a system call trace through the running of the utility. So bam. And it looks super gnarly when it barfs out its data. But what it's telling you, and actually let me run it again, but send it to less. Um, what it's really doing is, uh, that's not helping me either. Let's scroll up here. It's telling me about all the system calls that this command made, right? So we could see a uh, M map at the very top. This command allocated some memory for itself. Uh, we could see open at, right? It opened a file. And we actually are told in the additional data over there on the side what file it was. Um, and also you could see that there was an error code that was produced by some of those files that said no such file or directory. Um, new FS, sorry, new file stat at, uh, and this is actually at uh, getting some statistics because I ran DF, so I needed to figure out like how much disk space was used and stuff. So it used these system calls in order to produce that. Um, and so what we're looking at is sequentially from the top, all the system calls made on this command. With DF, that's not really that interesting because we ex know what to expect out of DF. It's gonna do some stuff to set up its environment. It's gonna collect some data. It's gonna print some tabular content on my file system usage. But where this is really handy is if you have problems with an application. So um, a lot of times for things like DNS troubleshooting, um, I'll attach a S trace to a utility. And what I'll see is it'll like everything is kind of normal and, and for varying degrees of what normal looks like, you have to figure that out. Um, and then it'll just kind of like repeat the same cycle of things over and over and over again. If you look at that cycle, it's like, oh, it's opening up a network connection to port 53 somewhere. And then it's waiting for a really long time. And then there's a timeout. And then it opens up port 53 again. And then it's God, waiting it can't be for DNS. Right. It's never DNS. Um, it's, <laughs> you can actually see what it's doing if you attach it to a running utility and you can observe kind of when it gets stuck in these cycles. And then you can figure out what's happening during that cycle to then determine where else you have to go for your uh, troubleshooting of a problem. All right. And then the last one, uh, let me kick off a quick uh, backend command here. Uh, watch. Watch is another wrapper for a command. And what it does is every two seconds, it runs the command again. And so uh, before I ran this, I kicked off a utility that would just like make a giant file and suck up all of my disk space. And so I want you to draw your attention to is this line, right? Because that's sitting there in the background running, slurping up my disk space. And you can see that every two seconds, uh, we're going to update there go. our watch and sure enough we can see it actually like changing the state of the system over time um so control c will kill it and i'm gonna kill all that dd so there we go um and so i use watch a lot for things like a really long process i'll do a cat on its log file or uh, there's a command for image builder called uh image builder cli or sorry a uh, composer cli where you can give it a compose ID and it'll query it and tell you its status. And so I could like have that over here while I was building my rel image um, and I can watch it occur. And then I'll know when it's done instead of having to query later or you know query it and it's not done and I have to wait longer. But can I make it beep every time it refreshes? <laughs> uh, you know what? For you, Nate, I think there is I'm a sure command you... to do that. <laughs> I I'm think sure you can. can. I'm... Maybe it would be a comp composite command of several things together to make the beeps happen. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, Nate, 
like ship you a UPS and you can unplug it from the wall and you can get there it. There we go. You uh, it just beep all the time no incessantly. Me. I'll just plug something really low power usage into it. So it lasts forever. <laughs> exactly. I'm sure your family would love that. <laughs> yeah. uh, Which they do exist. I saw, I, I, I saw a, a female and a, a, and a smaller female enter his office. So are they you do suggesting exist. that they're all a lie? <laughs> I wasn't sure. All right, we are an hour in, and we just <laughs> hit the halfway mark. <laughs> 53 commands in, and I made the joke on Monday, what if this 100th hundred episode, hundredth episode with 100 commands ended up being 100 minutes long? But uh, It may. <laughs> but All right. I, I, have, I have noticed that performance optimization or performance management and uh, disk are not nearly as humorous as apparently networking is so let, let's see how uh let's see how virtualization fares nate all right so we're going to talk about some virtualization commands now this is virtualization with libvirt and kvm this is in my home lab here that's how i run the thing uh, as i mentioned before I, you can manage this stuff with cockpit but i come from a very long background of managing kvm hosts from the command line even in a cluster environment i can tell you it's rewarding in its own way <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Versh is the thing that you interact with libvirt with. So I've got a number of VMs running on this host. We're going to do a Versh list, and it'll show us all the running hosts. Onus command, if we do a list dash A, it shows us, that's not A, it's dash dash all, isn't it? It shows you all of the hosts, right? Or all of the, the guests, um, including the ones that are shut off. So that's that's helpful thing. That's helpful if you're trying to see, like, what was the name of that system again before I turned it off? Uh, well, there it is. Uh, you can edit these things. They're all based in XML. If I do a Versh edit on ITT0, you might recognize this as one of the two hosts I've been doing all my demos on today. You can see here, like, it's got a UUID. It's got a name. It's got how much memory assigned to it. It's got, you know, all of the things you'd expect inside of a definition for a VM, right? Including like the disks and whether there's a CD-ROM attached and where the, if there was an ISO attached to that CD-ROM, where the path is, it's all right here. Everything is right here. And the really cool thing about it all being right there inside of XML is you can do a Versh dump XML. Dump XML on the host that you're talking about, or on the guest you're talking about, and it'll just dump all of it out, which you can then throw into a file and if you wanted to take that and put it on a different host, of course, you then have to copy the disk images that are associated with it as well. And any other files or hardware devices that it depends on need to be present on the other side. Uh, you can literally just then use Versh define, I think it is, to re-import that XML on another libvirt host. So this stuff is crazy portable, which is one of the things I really like about libvirt. Uh, I don't have an example cooked up for this, but there's a tool called vert install. Um, if you look, let's see, if I go into bin, I have a little script set up here to make VMs with uh, SH. Here we go. Uh, you can see I'm calling vert install here with a bunch of arguments. I didn't want to run this as we're on the show because it takes time to build a VM. But you can see, I'm basically saying vert install, give it a name based on a command line that I threw in there, okay, my command line argument, how much memory to give it, how many CPUs to give it, what variation of the operating system it's running, things like that. A couple other specifics. You can add in stuff like, you can see I pass in cloud in it at the end. Vert install is a really nice tool for if you want to automate uh, VM builds. So when I need to kick off a new VM, the VMs for this lab, I kicked off like two hours before the show started. I ran this command twice. I went and I set the networks and then boom, I had two VMs ready to go. So it's really, really nice to uh, to take some of that manual labor out of making a new VM. Okay, we're going to quit out of that. And let's see, what else do I got? QEMU image. This is a way to make an empty disk image that you can then use on your uh, libvirt system. You don't have to do this if you're using a tool that lets you like clicky clicky through a VM uh, creation. But if you did like, if you did do vert install, for example, and you needed an empty disk to point it at, you could use QEMU, QEMU image to make it. It's hard to say. So QEMU dash IMG QEMU. Those of you who don't know, KVM 
which is what's backed, which what is behind Libvirt in this case, is based on a project called QEMU. So that's why QEMU is in here. I forget what QEMU stands for. It's a very old uh, hypervisor or virtualization platform you can run on Linux. Anyway, I digress. So QEMU image, we're gonna do create, because we're gonna make a new disk image. We're gonna give that, we're gonna give a format to that disk image, Q cow two q c o this is hard to type q c o w two and then we're going to give it a file name we're going to just call it disk dot q cow two a q cow two is a disk format that, is, that supports thin provisioning which is why i'm using that instead of a uh, there, there are raw formats you can do dash dash f raw that'll allocate the entire disk after you issue the command Thin provision means that it makes like a stub of a disk and it'll let you fill up to a maximum size. I'm going to make that maximum size one gig just for the sake of example. And there you go. Formatting disk.qcow2 with the format, yada, yada, yada. ls-l on disk.qcow2. And you'll see the thing is not one gigabyte. And that's because it's a thin provision disk. So this means that it's, it's there. You can fill up to a gigabyte but it only has like this framework of the disk that's actually existing on your hypervisor's disk. So it saves a lot of space. Another great tool is vert clone. What that'll do is it'll let you take one VM and clone it to another. And what I used to use this for in the case of our old hypervisor, our old cluster, was we had to find a basic VM that met our standards, right? And then we had that defined inside of, inside of libvert. But we didn't, we didn't actually run that machine. It was called a clone me. We could have called it a sheep or whatever. I don't know, but we called it clone me. That was the name of the thing. So when you want to make a new VM, you would say vert clone, you'd give it the source, you'd give it a destination name, and it would take that VM and copy it to a new VM. And we had it all set up so that the disk was sanitized and whatever. So all the identifying data was out. So on first boot, it would do things like generate new SSH keys and all the things that have to happen when you make a, an actual new machine. But it's a really nice way to save time. If I wanted to take ITT0 and clone it to ITT3, I could use vert clone to do it. So it's really handy. Really good way to make uh, an exact copy of an of a existing system. And that's virtualization. I had a couple more examples here for the next section, but uh, anything we want to talk about virtualization wise first? Uh, so the the important question in chat is does QCow2 support cows? Um uh, it, it supports copy on write, I think, is what COW stands for. Is that what that he, means? He it, Scott. I, I could be wrong. No, 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 no. I get it. Does it support actual cows? I don't, I don't think there's any cows in my hypervisor. Uh, cow say could be in there. I saw some mention of that in there. Can we clone right. cows instead of sheep? Oh, the, Maybe that's how it supports them. There you go. Yeah, you use vert clone to, to clone your cows. Vert clone that, to clone your cows. That's where my milk comes from. Got it. Clone cat. All right. Uh, next two commands. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, the next next are some environment things, which are actually really helpful when you're doing things like scripting. Or, I don't know, maybe you just forgot what time it is and you need to know what time it is. The date command will give you that. Gives you the date and the time. But that's not always useful. Say I'm making a shell script to, like, back up my data, and I want to add a date stamp into the file that I backed it up to. Date is really good for that. And this I'm going to copy because I'm going to typo this 100 times if I try to type it out manually. But so funny enough, I've I've had that problem in the past and I actually found a website that you type in the date and and it'll spit out uh, the the date command for you. <laughs> That's handy. Uh, so date allows you to change the output format. Right. And people will probably argue as to what the proper format for a backup file is, but it's really going to depend on how often you're doing backups and when you're doing them, things like that. But in this case, we're doing date. Capital Y is the year. Uh, M is the day of the month, I think. No, M is the month. Sorry. M is the, the month, like the numerical zero to 12 or one to 12. And there is no month zero. Uh, and then D is the day of the month, right? So if I'd run that, you're going to see we get like this nice little formatted date string that's just 2024, 03, 22, because that's today's date. So if I was making a backup file, I could throw that into a variable or I could use it in an escape sequence that it would auto populate that in the name of the file. And there you go. You got your date stamp. I've used this in a lot of, uh, I've used this in scripts and whatnot when I want yep. to track. Uh, 
when a process started and when it stopped. So take take date, pipe it into your script, and it'll say you can add some text to it and say this this operation backing up the database at X Y Z time. All right, thank you, Nate. That uh, that getting us closer to a minute per command. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so speaking of scripts. <laughs> Scott, would you like to talk a little bit about scripting? Sure. So another oldie but goodie. Way back in episode 18, we talked about writing shell scripts. Um, but there's actually a whole bunch of scripting languages included in RHEL, like um, Python. So, oops, I want to do version. That's not what I wanted. <laughs> See, this is what happened. There we go. Python. Let me out of here. Version. There we go. Uh, so we ship various versions of Python. System Python for RHEL 9 is 3.9. Uh, we also ship Nate's personal favorite. Oh, please, Pearl. no. No, don't don't type it, please. Oh, yeah, Pearl. Hey, look, oh. it's the extractioniest and languagiest of the uh, scripting languages. Indeed, indeed. You know, I, I heard that the the latest edition of Perl has been renamed to something, uh, Raku, R-A-K-U. I, I didn't even know. <clears throat> but yeah, Perl, my first language. That was the first, other than Bash and like Batch in the Windows days, uh, Perl mm -hmm. was my first like real language that I learned. I, I had a course, systems administrator manager who used Perl like I use Bash commands. And it's like, ugh. So, not... Not for nothing, like we used to use Perl a lot because it had um, really good reporting. And by reporting, I mean like formatted printing, the ability to like extract data out of the middle of other pieces of data. So you could use like regexes, yeah. not a, what we're going to cover with said, but like you could do it all in one um, command or sorry, not command. You could build your own custom scripting that would be your own program to do all that stuff. Um all right, and then on the uh, on the terminal here, I just ran bash and it invoked another shell for me. But running bash is kind of silly. I think where we get into more interest is when you make your own script. And you usually start with a shebang so that we know what interpreter to use. Uh, and this yep. would also hold true for Python and Perl. Uh, and some of the others, probably not uh, C. Uh, it's not an interpreted language, so that one not so Indeed. much. But all the interpreted languages, you tell it what interpreter to use. All right, um, so we'll come back to this script in just a second because I want to talk about a couple other command line things that you can do uh, to get data. So for example, uh, one of the things that we use a lot is said. And uh, Nate, I'm going to put you on blast here. Do you remember what SED stands for? Streamline editor, right? Stream editor. Very good. Stream editor. See, this is why Nate's the uh, Nate's the host now. Eric. <laughs> <laughs> you think Eric? Eric, would you have known that? Nope. <laughs> I hope you don't ask all me right, what so AUG stands for, though, because I have no idea. <laughs> it's it's the sound birds make. Oh, um, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so said is a stream editor. So you like feed into it some data or you feed into it a file like I'm doing here. And then you use a series of edits that you want made to that, uh, made to that file. And the edits are going to be a command. So in this case, I'm going to substitute. Then you give it what you want to substitute, which is a regular expression. I'm using a really simple one of just colons. Anytime you see a colon, make the substitution. Uh, then the next thing is what you want to replace that colon with. So I just said space. Uh, and then G at the end is a modifier that says do this globally throughout the entire file. Otherwise, it probably stops the first time on a line that experiences the colon and does substitution. Uh, and so, right, this is what Etsy password looks like. We didn't use colons instead of spaces to, uh, or use spaces instead of colons to separate all the content. Looks so much easier to separate uh, that way. I don't know why we don't do it that way. That's right, because like especially the Nginx web server, that should entirely be three different fields in the file. <laughs> uh, 
So you could do all kinds of stream edits to files. I'm trying to think of some other things that, uh, oh, I, remember that horrible command we were talking about with T-log earlier? Um, I'm sure I use a set in that to like Probably. get rid of stuff or to only pull out things that I'm interested in, uh, in that stream of log content. I've, I've used uh, uh, said to make interactive changes. Um, like for instance, for my leap upgrade labs, I'll use a said command to change the SSH default login to permit uh, root false and, mm. and switch it from true. That way rel eight will, will do an in-place upgrade to rel nine without getting uh, without getting an error message. Yeah, like, or uh, putting it into a script that you do post installation to make some tweaks to um, configuration files before you ship the machine off or start it up for the first time. Like, those are all great uses of said. Um, the other command line utility that you can use for quick and dirty programming would be awk. So uh, here's an example of using awk. So I'm going to use that the same for data Nate? I said, don't ask. <laughs> um, so awk is taking data that we get passed either through a pipeline or through a redirect and then can do a whole bunch of stuff on it. Um, where I see it used most commonly is just a really quick program. Awk has its own programming syntax. So this is a quick awk program to print something to the screen. Uh, we're going to print the first field out of the data that we get, uh, then a tab, and then the third field of the data we get. There we go. Um, so remember, before we saw the um, Etsy password file with spaces instead of uh, colons. Well, now we're just going to see the username and the user ID number, and there's a tab separator between them. Uh, yeah. So you can do something like that. There's other commands you could use too to get the same thing, um, but like hut or that kind of stuff. But awk has a whole bunch of um, controlling uh, programmatic features that you can use to say, if it's this, then do these things, um, or right. regular expression That's inside of it. That's the really cool stuff that you can use logic against these things, right? Like if the first value is greater than five, print the third value, right? It's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. Um, something else that's quick and dirty on the command line is sort. So um, if you use du to show disk usage on your machine, it shows you all the files and their size in blocks. Um, but maybe you're not really interested in all the files and their size. Maybe you're interested in the largest files on your disk. So we're going to pipe that to sort. And I told it to reverse the sort. So show me biggest things, not smallest things first. And N, treat that uh, first thing as a number instead of character-based sorting. And so it runs the same list of files, but now it says, all right, here's, here's where the largest things are, right? So if I'm looking for something like, where can I go to clean up space because I've just discovered my disks are full, you can find out where uh, your file system is using the most space, what directories contain the largest uh, collections of files. All right, but back into scripting. All right, so um, when you're writing a script, this is going to be a super simple, very quick one. Uh, you can echo... That's going to print a message from your script. And echo by itself just prints a blank line. Uh, read will actually prompt the user for, actually will re retrieve input from the user. I'm using dash P to say, also ask the user a question before you read the input. And I need to give it a variable at the end. Um, so now that we've collected some data from the user, maybe we need to make a choice off of it.
And so here we're using the if command and also the test command. That's what the square bracket is. And that's going to resolve to a true or false value. And the EQ command. Man, we're just like loading up on commands here in scripting. Yeah, we're just uh, blowing that number out of the water. I, don't, I think Shantanu would disagree, though. It's always got to be a pirate, doesn't it, Scott? I like pirates. They're my favorite. It's always, always uh, got to be a pirate. Yeah, so we uh, have the then command, which says after this if results to a true or false, then do this task. Uh, else, if it turns out you failed the check, what should we do instead? Uh, and then fee, yet another command, which is the backwards of if, uh, to close out this control structure. All it right, is so kind of hilarious we're... how so many closer closes of statements or of uh, containers like that in Bash are just the same thing spelled backwards, like case. You close it with ESAC. Hmm. <laughs> you can see that I put the uh, a bogus uh, test in my conditional. Ah, uh, here's why. Did you break it? Oh, I see why you didn't. He did. The... He did break it. You broke it. What could go wrong, Scott? It's a live left. Ah, oh, geez. Oh, integer expression. Hold on. I'm using the wrong comparison operator. So <laughs> dash EQ equal equal. Equal. Uh, uh, let's take try. off the Q. There we go. All right. Yes. So we got the right thing. And what if I say Yay. robot? Well, robot is not the same as pirate. So you get the, the else branch of your uh, of your script. Your script is not very inclusive, Scott. It only only treats pirates in the way that they prefer to be treated, and everybody else gets treated in English. <laughs> well, yes, because only pirates are special, Nate. One, okay. one could argue that ninjas are also special, but we don't ever see them, so how would we know? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> true. <laughs> oh, I'm going to get called by HR now. All right, we got to roll along. We're running out of time here. <laughs> uh Man, so I have the next section as well, which is some user stuff. And I know that we did a managing users episode. It was like one of our very first episodes, uh, Eric. Yeah, let me, like uh, let me see, because my my uh, my my uh, person who set up the section didn't cite his his uh, episodes. I know that was my fault. Oh, we All were right. supposed to do that. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, Another command that we use a lot is sudo. Sudo allows you to have a regular user become uh, privileged to do a specific task. And we've gone ahead and set up the rel user to be root equivalent. So as long as they use sudo, they can pretty much do whatever root can do if they prefix it with sudo. So here I'm just going to install some software. Um, but before we just let anyone walk up and sudo something, you actually have to prove your identity to show that you're actually the, that user and not just some rando that walked up to the keyboard. All right, so there we go. So here we are running uh, running that DNF install. And then when it completes, it sends me back to being my unprivileged self. Um, and I can verify that with Whoami. You can run Whoami to see who you are logged into the system. Um, we can I'm also sorry, look whoami? at who Yeah, who who pronounces it that way. It's who am I? No, no, because who am I is this. All right, so who am I is actually a separate command on most other Unixes, who am which I? is why it's who am I. That's more uh, fun. Um, so we can do things like, as root, we can look at people's user information with ID. So I can look at the user ID numbers and group ID numbers and what groups this person is a member of uh, using ID on a specific user. Um, we can also look at a subset of that. So I could do a groups on rel. And these are the groups that the user rel belongs to the rel group and the wheel group. Uh, and it turns out the wheel group membership is what gave them the root equivalent sudo access. Um, we can also look at password aging information. And, and actually Eric showed us this earlier. 
So if we do a change dash L on rally, uh, we could see things like when they last changed their password or if there's any password limitation data of stored for this user, like how many days they are allowed to keep a password or when their account expires. Uh, we can also look I already at the, use that command. Well, I added a bunch in scripting, so it's fine. Um, we can see the last command shows you who's logged into the system. And I don't know who that ME guy is, but uh, he logs in my system a lot. Uh, or that <laughs> reboot guy. That reboot guy logs Creepy. in a lot. Um, and lastly, as root, uh, you may recognize this command to change your password, but as root, uh, you can change other people's passwords. And notice it doesn't ask you what their password is first. So it just assigns whatever you say as their password, right? We do that. And even if it's a bad password, We'll make the assignment. So this is how you do things like password resets on RHEL. So we're at, we're at like command 80. 70. Yeah, 70. getting via 80. Coming up on 80. <laughs> Nate, I'll hand it to you. All right, we're going to touch a bit on compression and archival tools. Uh, there was an episode about this, I believe, or maybe a part of another episode, but... Apparently, I didn't do my homework. Sorry. <laughs> we have to get the... Oh, gosh. Come on. Where's the producer? <laughs> the producer. <laughs> the producer is losing his mind trying to keep track of all the, all the links. Producer's getting the wrong terminal up. Okay, so uh, zip and unzip. Uh, we're just going to kind of blast through these quick. I've got a bunch of files here. We're just going to make a zip archive out of them. So we're going to do zip and then we're going to take, and this is a the thing you have to install. There are two different packages, zip and unzip to make these two work. So we're going to do zip and then we give it the name of the file, file.zip, and then the files we want to put in there. And of course you can use, you know, glomming with, uh, globbing, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Sorry if my dog's I don't know what the heck she's barking at. So anyway, uh, there we go. We have file.zip. You'll notice the, the compressed quote unquote archive is larger than my files because my files are empty. They're just here for example. I promise you that this does not make a larger archive out of smaller files. It's just the way it works out <laughs> when the files are so small. Uh, so uh, <laughs> and then of course, unzip. We're going to go into temp to do this. We're going to unzip this file up here file.zip and oops ls dash l there we go we've got f1 f2 and f3 so now we're gonna delete those so nate, just because yeah nate do you know why it's larger than your files it's it's because of metadata that goes along with the zip archive there yeah. you go All right. See, i knew that one <laughs> didn't i i was I'm, I'm hurrying here okay we're at we're at an hour and a half <laughs> my next meeting's with my manager it's fine <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to be on the road to a retirement party. So, <laughs> and my earpiece oh, yeah. is dying. We have to wrap this up. <laughs> okay. So, um, where was I? So we did zip and unzip. Now we're going to do tar and tar and gzip and a couple other, other, uh, compression utilities usually go together, right? Tar isn't for compressing. It's actually just for like sticking files together so that you can take them into a tape archive, right? Um, it doesn't really do compression exactly. So gzip can come along or bzip, or I think there was another one that can come along and work along with tar, but we're going to show you tar, just like plain old bare tar here. So we're going to do tar CF, which stands for create uh, file, I believe. And then uh, we're going to do the name of the file we want to create. We're going to call it file.tar. And then we're going to take the same arguments, F1, F2, and F3. Those are my three files. And again, we're going to end up with an archive that's larger than our uh, original one because of that metadata. You see that tar must store, me store more metadata than, um, than zip does. So now that we have that, I'm going to show you how we can gzip and gunzip the tar file or any file, honestly. What gzip will do is it'll take the file. So you just tell it, what file do I want to compress? File.tar. Press enter. And what it's going to do is it's going to replace file.tar with file.tar.gz. And now you'll notice that it's much smaller than 
the original tar file was right before it was what almost a k a little over a k well 1024 whatever it was big bigger now it's 135 bytes right so uh you can see that the gzip did do its job now you could then use g unzip to decompress and then what it'll do is it takes the .gz extension, drops it off, and replaces it with the uncompressed version of the file you just compressed. So if we do gunzip, and then file.tar.gz, and then ls-l, there we are back to that larger file. And then if I go into my temp directory here and do a tar, um, what is it, xf? I have it in my notes here. Yes, xf, which stands for extract. Uh, we're going to take that file.tar and then it'll extract it right to the directory that I'm in. And there's my F1, F2, and F3, just like we did with, with zip and unzip. So that's tar, gzip, gunzip, zip, and unzip. And we have one more that sort of ended up in archiving for some reason. Blame Scott. Uh, is DD. It was Scott's fault. DD is an awesome utility. It's great for creating empty files or blowing away disks that you didn't intend to. So be careful. Your mileage may vary here. <laughs> um, we're just going to copy and paste this for the sake of time. But basically, Please. what I've got here is oh. DD, which is data dumper, right? DD is what that stands for. Um, you give it an input file. I've used dev0, which basically is just a stream of zeros. OF, I tell it where I want the output file to go. This is dot slash out. I tell it the block size and how many of those blocks to write. And there we go. We have a roughly four megabyte file uh, that was created from DD. What's so funny? Who's uh... <laughs> Sorry, I should have been on mute, but... <laughs> <laughs> the cat's mentioning that we can use uh, gzip later so that our episode will be smaller than 100 minutes. We should do that, right? And this this might be a good example here, right? If we gzip, <laughs> we gzip this um, this file that I just made, right? So right now it's four megabytes. If we gzip it, now now we'll have a much smaller, it's 4,000, you know, it's 4K now instead of four meg because it's all zeros. Zeros compress really well, right? So there we go. Better example of gzip. And uh, that's it for compression utilities. Like I said, there's other utilities out there other than gzip. There's like bzip and a couple others. Uh, but for the sake of example, here we are. I bet Nate can rapid fire the last 16 oh. commands. Yes, the last commands are basically, these are your absolute basics, right? And they're in here just because we can't have a list of 100 essential commands if you don't know how to like get around your directory structure and things like that. So let's, uh, first of all, clean up the screen a bit here. We've been using ls a lot, right? This gives you just a simple directory structure or a directory listing. ls-l will give you a long listing, including things like ownership and file sizes and creation dates, things like that. Uh, ls-al will show you hidden files. You see I have a hidden directory called Ansible. I have another one called cache and config because this is my home directory on this particular uh, machine, right? So A. ls-z will give us se Linux contexts. Now, these are important if you're trying to troubleshoot or even create files uh, that need a specific se Linux context. You can see what those contexts are right here from the LZ. Um, you can also combine those commands with other things, right? So dash A and dash AL, dash L, dash AZ, right? These are all things that you can combine to make, make a thing, um, make uh, combinations of, of the different outputs. Uh, let's see, next on the list is cat. We're gonna do cat dash VET, and this is one of Scott's favorites. The dash VET tells it to display hidden characters. So if you've got a file that has hidden characters like tabs or carriage returns or whatever. Maybe it came from a Windows machine because it's they're notorious for having those those hidden files or those hidden characters. This will show them to you so that you'll you'll be like, well, why is the output not like I thought it was? Why is the file not parsing the way I thought it was? Well, this will help you see that. And we're just going to use a file that's in here. We use the index HTML from earlier. And you see it just shows you the contents of the file. Another very similar tool is called Zcat. Zcat is really helpful because what Zcat will do is take a compressed file, as long as that file is text, although it'll probably do this on files that aren't text, it'll just give you a bunch of gibberish on the screen. If you do Zcat, you see I have a messages.gz here. This I just took varlog messages, put it in my home directory, and then I gzipped it. 
we do messages.gz. It automatically does the decompression and then displays it to me, but it doesn't leave me with a decompressed file. I'm still right there where I was. So a lot of times your log rotation schemes are going to have a spot where the the file that was rotated out becomes a uh, a separate compressed file. Uh, this this way you can look in those files without having to decompress them first. And you can also tie that to other commands. Like you can pipe that output into grep. Or I guess there's, uh, it looks like Shantanu's mentioning zgrep, which we didn't put on our list, but there you go. See, we're slowly adding up all of the, all those commands you said that, that were not actually commands. We're adding them in as we go, Shantanu. <laughs> so, uh, well, right. Ryan, did, did you know that less actually does zcat if you less a encrypted or a compressed file? Does it? Well, we'll we're going to try that right now because that's another one on my list. In fact, it's the next one on my list. So we're going to zcat, or sorry, we're going to less messages.t or .gz. And there you go. You're right. Less did the zcat for me. So this gives us a paginated um, output. It's not even paginated. It's, it's in what you would consider uh, almost like an editor. You can do searches in here. Like if I want to search for Mar, because it's March, it'll highlight them for me and show them. I want to look for See, see, I have a bunch of hibernation events there. You could search for the word hibernation. This is a great way to look through log files or just find something in a text file. So less. Less is more, right? More is less. <laughs> ah, what do we got next? Less is more, but with... Less is more, but better. <laughs> okay, uh, the next is locate. If you've ever not been able to find a file on a Linux file system, don't worry, you're not alone. And locate is here to help you. It's not here by default. You have to install mlocate to get that to go, to get that to work. We're just gonna locate anything with the word password in it. So now you find any files in your file system that have the word password. And of course you can get more sophisticated than that. This is a quick example. Uh, let's say you need to know where you are in the directory structure, pwd. Eric, what does that stand for? I know this one. I know this one. It's print working directory. Good job. PWD prints your working directory. So you can see where you are in the file system. If you were in like some gnarly deep directory, PWD will give you exactly where you're at. Um, let's see. CD. This is simple, right? CD. How do I move around? CD. What was the name of my subdirectory here? Files, right? Wasn't it? Compact now, disk. Here we go. If I do PWD again, we've got, you know, you can see that we're inside of the files directory now. Some really cool extra commands that go along with CD. If you want to get to your home directory, you do CD space tilde. Takes you right back to your home directory. If you want to get back to the last directory you were in, CD space dash will take you back where you just were. Like, oh, crap, I didn't mean to switch out of that directory. Or what path was it? Or I don't want to type it again. CD dash gets you right back there. There's probably a bunch of other shortcuts for CD that I'm not thinking of at the moment. If you type straight up CD, it takes you to, home, to your home directory as well. There you go. CD will also take you to, to your home directory. That tilde, by the way, is a great way to put in any kind of file path. So if you want to say, put a file in my home directory, you can copy it to tilde, and it'll go right to your home directory. Okay, my earpiece has reminded me once again that the battery's dying. So I've got uh, like seven more commands to get through. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> All right, move, MV. Not M E M V will let you move file. Let me clear my screen so you guys can see better. Uh, so let's take let's pick a file. We're gonna M V move also works as a good way to rename a file. So if you just want to rename something, you're essentially doing the same command as moving. So we use the same command on Linux. So M V messages to like messages.gz2. I don't know. And now you can see it's been renamed. And now Bash doesn't recognize it as an archive anymore. It doesn't highlight it for me. Uh, but MV and a bunch of the other commands we're about to go about have uh, uh, a command line argument that you might want to care about. Dash I, I think it stands for interactive, which basically means if I'm going to move a thing and it's going to overwrite another thing, the dash I will make it prompt me to say, yeah, I really did want to do that. So if I do MV index.html to messages.gz2, it should say, are you sure? Right? You want to overwrite that? Then I have to tell it yes or no. Well, I'm going to tell it no. You can override that with dash F. If I, if I add a dash F here, it'll be like, yes, I absolutely want to do that. And then it just doesn't even ask me. Now, in, in, in RHEL, uh, for root, and I, I don't think for normal users, maybe that's changed for normal users now too, but it always used to be in root, 
you those the dash i is added to mv rm cp and a couple other commands so that you don't accidentally mess things up as root as easily as you might as a normal user right because root has a lot more power um so just keep that in mind. So if you're working as root and you haven't changed that, dash F might be your friend, especially in scripting, where you want to move the thing and you don't want it to be sitting there saying, are you sure? So keep that in mind. All right, rm deletes a file. So if I want to do rm the messages.gz2, that'll just delete it. And again, gives me that dash I option. I'm going to say no, because I don't actually want to delete this. Dash F again will force that. And CP will let me copy a file. So if I want to CP messages.gz2 back to messages.gz, now I have two copies of messages. And again, I know these are really simple commands, but how do you how do you not include these when you're talking about 100 commands, right? And again, you've got the dash I and the dash F options for CP. Uh, another great one here is um, another great one is the touch command. What touch will do is it'll make a file, an empty file. You may have noticed that the files I made earlier for my compression example were all empty. Touch is exactly how I made them. If I want to make a directory, mkdir, some directory. Now I've got a new directory there, right? And our very last command in the list is file. File is really useful to try to identify what's, not what's in a file, but what type of file it is, right? It'll give you some information about what's in there, but this is like the file system metadata about a file. I do file on messages.gz. It'll tell me it's an HTML document. Well, it's not an HTML document, right? It ends in .gz. But do you remember what I did earlier? I copied that index.html file on top of messages.gz. So even though Bash even thinks it's a GZ file by, by highlighting it red, it's actually not. It's an HTML file. If I cat it right now, you'll see that the contents of that index.html are still in there. And file is smart enough to figure that out. File is really useful for if you're looking for like, is this thing I'm about to open up in a text editor binary or text, right? Because sometimes you don't want to open up a binary file in a text editor because it really messes with your terminal. And I think that's it. What I miss? <laughs> well, uh, Nate, I know you got to get on the road. So I'm going to say I, I do. do and your service today. Um, and Eric and I can go ahead and close out the episode. I did want to end on one last command. We've covered actually over a hundred, by the way, if anyone's keeping track. Well, it's like a hundred. Nate, Nate counted dash I and dash F as two commands. Stop. So I, I, I think Scott added some extras in scripting. So I think somewhere in there, I think we'll, but Scott, I think you had one more that wasn't on the list that, uh, that I, we're going to add just for, just to make sure. Just for today. Here we go. Bam. No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I do got to uh, run. This has been great. Thank you, all the people who are viewing today. We got so many more viewers than normal today. But I do have to drop to get on the road. Thank you for. Uh, for yeah, go ahead, Nate. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll, so. we'll, we'll land the plane while you uh, jump out with a parachute. So, cool. Have a great. So, in one. case you all missed, <laughs> in case you didn't see it, because Scott didn't narrate it, Scott did an rm dash rf on slash. So everything Sla slash, actually slash slash star. star. So yeah. everything is currently being deleted, uh, which yeah. I think includes the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Eric, so yeah. here's here's the thing, Scott. I I swore when you suggested this idea. I mean, I've. I've nominated myself as our producer, which today reminds me of why I produce this show, because there's just so much that goes on that I couldn't host and produce like I do Rel Presents. So I, I stepped back and let Nate come in and and he's he's been an amazing host. And don't tell him I said that and tell him not to watch the recording. But uh, oh, the connection dropped. <laughs> it deleted <laughs> SSH. <laughs> so. But I mean, this show has been so much fun. Oh, what I was saying about this episode, and I, I've got to tie into our wrap up. But uh, what I have got to say that what when we when you proposed this idea on Monday, the initial reaction from Nate and I was, "You are insane. Go take a walk and come back." 
but neither of us had anything cool to do for our hundredth episode. So I said, okay, as the producer, as as the host, yes, let's do it. I'm all all about crazy ideas. And the show actually started with one of those, which was also your fault. Yeah, and yeah, <laughs> I said my I only this, the most insane thing we did since we started the show. Yes. My my caveat was that this not be a hundred minutes for a hundred commands on our hundredth episode. And while I was proven right, we were not going to do a hundred minute long episode. We're actually sitting at a hundred and six minutes coming up. So I should have specified, keep it under, you know, 90, but we didn't, but it's okay. But I mean, that, that's, that's been what the show's about. We, we, it used to be on a different day. Uh, it used to be at a different time. And so Friday at lunchtime just seemed like the right place for this. And, uh, and and thank you, Shantanu, because we were freaking out this morning. Like, is this actually going to work? <laughs> but uh, I mean, gosh, ITT just passed its two year anniversary and now we've hit 100 episodes and it's been so much fun. And we've got we've got plans for hopefully a few more. <laughs> we've actually got plans for a couple of dozen more. Um, but Scott, the, this show actually started with an experiment. So what, how did we launch this show initially? So, so the reason we're at a hundred episodes is because our first month we produced an episode every single day. Um, and then we actually repeated it twice because we weren't sure like when people would tune in. So we did one every morning at 10 AM and one every evening at like 8 PM. Uh, trying to pick up the West Coasters and uh, and Asia folks. Um, but yeah, like, honestly, Eric, this has been a grueling episode to to run through, but not nearly as grueling as coming up with 25 shows and then recording them every single day for 25 days. So yeah, those, those two days were brutal. I think that was more brutal than having 25 topics. So when we started, it's like, we're a show about systems administration. This should be easy, right? And I think that was easier, though, than the two a days. But but uh, yeah, into the terminal, 100 episodes. Scott and Nate, you guys are doing awesome as hosts. I'm, I'm really proud to uh, I, ha I have a lot more fun as the host, but uh, uh, I'm really, really proud to, to be producing the show and and uh, and seeing where it goes from here. So um, do we have Oh, we, we do have a topic. Uh, so I was going to throw Nate under the bus for this. So what's what's 101? What's 101? What's episode 101 going to be? Oh, episode 101 is um, <laughs> we're going to continue our services and workloads arc. And we're, we covered basic web server, which according to our viewer statistics, nobody really cares about. Uh, but so now we're going to do <laughs> an actual service. Like we're going to start off with WordPress. That's also going to mix in some database stuff uh, to make a more complex application that we deploy on top of our machine. So the gauntlet has been dropped, Scott. Shantanu says 200 commands for the 200th episode. Man, that means we have to make it to 200 episodes. Well, we, we are on our way. We'll, we'll be wrapping up our services arc. Well, Nate and Scott will. Um, if you missed it, I, I can't, uh, can't over-promote last week's episode, the Bad Batch episode, where Brian Smith and myself uh, from RHEL Presents took over into the terminal. And uh, we talked about the GNOME uh, desktop, uh, some, some tips and tricks, and we didn't even cover half of what we what we planned for. So uh, we might have to do a takeover episode again. But speaking of uh, RHEL Presents, this past week, we, uh, we met with a couple of folks to talk about. Um, yeah, I got the same notification there, Scott. Our, our team meeting is coming up in 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, so last this past Wednesday, we talked about Stratus, the uh, a file system utility management tool. I'm still not sure how to classify it. It's not a file system, but it's a system that manages file systems. So check out Stratus. Uh, really excited. Coming up in about a week and a half, we're going to be talking about, I'm, I don't know, I called it the life cycle of a subscription. We're going to be talking about subscriptions, life cycle, uh, activation keys, and and so much more on RHEL Presents with Rich Dorito. He's joining us uh, for, his, for his typical spring update. So looking forward to touching base with him next week to figure out what we're talking about. But, uh, but we'll be and, live here in, in two weeks with that. And if you've not <laughs> seen a Rich Dorito episode of something... Uh, Rich Dorito is the czar of subscriptions at Red Hat. So like 
how do you register machines? How do we count them? What What's the difference between like VDC and what are the mechanics for doing that? And what about rail in the cloud? Like dude knows all the things about subscriptions. Yeah, he he takes a topic that most people take for granted and makes it really interesting. I always learn stuff when he comes on the show. Very, very charismatic person. Uh, really glad to call him a friend and coworker. So join us for Rel Presents. It'll be much more interesting than it sounds. I guarantee you that. Also coming up, uh, first full week of May, so May 6th through the 9th, is Red Hat Summit. Uh, so if you haven't yet, try and grab a ticket, beg your boss, uh, drive around on Uber, whatever you've got to do to raise the money to come to Red Hat Summit. It'll be in Denver, Colorado uh, in May. Uh, I'll be there. Scott and Nate will be there. Matthew, one of our teammates, will be there. And so, so many Red Hatters, customers, partners, enthusiasts. Uh, it'll be an amazing time. Lots, lots to go on there. Uh, and then one final uh, note. Thank you to everyone who hung out for the live show we're at one hour, 51 minutes almost. And I think this is the best turnout for an end of the terminal episode ever. I saw it peak around 30, 35 people watching this live. So if you're in the chat, if you've watched this live, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was so much fun with, with all of you. And, and you get to see some of the banter that kind of goes on behind the scenes. And, and as Ken says, yes, your, your OS does matter. Um, and it cannot be faked, right, Scott? That's right. So on behalf of Nate, Scott, and myself, our hosts for today, and on behalf of the entire Red Hat Enterprise Linux team, he vamps as he pulls up the out outro bumper. Um, thank you all for joining us. This has been Into the Terminal, episode 100, where we did, in fact, cover 100 commands to celebrate our 100th episode. We'll see you all next week. Bye, Scott, everybody. are you going to say your ridiculous line? Happy Into the Terminaling. We'll see you all.